right, welcome everyone to the Adorama's Photographers Roundtable. I'm Kishore Saw. I am joined today by Aaron Babnik, Pete McBride, Keith Lazinski, Jacob Riglin, and Chris Burkhardt. And uh, we'll get right to it. I think one of the first questions we should probably start with is going to be relevant for everyone watching and everyone here, and that is, is photography today as important as it was 10, 20 years ago? And the reason I ask that is because if we look at the volume that's coming out, you know, there's a stat that came out a little while ago that said, you know, every two minutes today, there's more imagery being produced in the entirety of the 20th century. So sort of basic supply and demand here, affecting value. What do you think? I think it's a sign of value. Uh, photography has become so um, prominent and so popular because it's it's meeting a lot of needs that are part of I guess the zeitgeist I think of of today. It's something that's immediate, that's relatable, and because so many people it gets accessible, you know, it's sort of democratic in that sense. Everyone can kind of get into it to some extent and relate to it. Therefore, so yeah. I also consider that you know it's really interesting. I've over the last couple of years, I've been able to um, study quite a bit of Ansel's work, and one of the things that um, really dawned on me when I was um, at the Center for Creative Photography, where they store his archives, um, and sitting there talking with the archivist, was was chatting upon how, you know, when when they started with photography, art had nothing to do with it. It was not an art form at all. It was a it was something used to to document something more scientific, right? right. And they fought tooth and nail, like fought actually to have photography considered art for museums, for galleries, like here in New York City. I mean, this was like a really big deal. So I would say it's probably the number one form of art nowadays when you think about um, young people trying to like express themselves or anything. It's 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 what kind of comes to my mind first and foremost. And I think that's why there's <clears throat> there's never been more pictures being taken than there is today is because phones, right? Sure. And I think that the paradigm of photography's value, I think, is has always been incredibly important in the editorial world for, for spreading messages, things that are happening around the world, stories that are being told that, that um, some of them are uplifting stories, some of them are just straight news in the editorial world. There's fine art photography, there's fashion photography, there's photography is used for many different things and, and really has been for decades and decades. Um, I think most of the pictures being taken today are, are people just you know, st storing memories and enjoying the time and celebrating like a, a good time with the with the photograph. It's like a communication tool more so than anything. You absolutely. Know? You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's so handy because now yeah. the, the reason there's more pictures being taken now today is because more people have a camera and a reliable camera, you know. Yeah, one a on usable one that they can actually make yeah. cool images with. I think one other interesting thing about it is that there's with this increase of imagery, there, there may be a level of saturation, but it, sure. uh, at the same time, it also, in my opinion, showcases that story is still the importance of story. Because everyone can make a beautiful image today, but if you can weave that with a story, personal story, another person's story, it has another value and it's having further reach, so it's, it's pretty cool to see that. I mean, that's gotta be key with the way you guys do. I mean, it's to being able to tell that story, right, through your landscape imagery. I was going to say, on to the point of that, I think like it also challenges photographers like us to step up the game. Obviously, there's so many other people taking photos, and whether it's just for a hobby or as a passion or trying to make it as a full-time career, it does mean there's a lot more people in the same space doing the same thing, and, and it definitely means you have to, I guess, be more, I guess, think even more about what you're creating and, 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 and push even harder because there are so many more people in the space. I mean, like smartphones, you can take a world-class image on any smartphone now. As, be as best you can with any of the DSLRs that we have as well. So, yeah, it's definitely a challenge and an exciting one at the same time. I mean, especially for landscape photography, I feel like landscape photography is has got to be one of the most saturated at the moment. And um, I'm curious as to all of you guys move around everywhere, and you made the entire world that much more accessible. Um, but where is the mystery anymore, and how do you still keep people engaged with what you do? Mm. That's a good question. That's a great question, yeah. actually. Because it's true, we blo like photographers, especially if you have an audience like via social media outlet, locations get kind of blown in the sense that you might go to some really cool location as soon as you geotag it and if people sure. respond to that photograph, 
it's natural that people want to go there, experience it for themselves, and photograph it for themselves. That's certainly when I was first getting into photography. I lived in magazines, I lived in coffee table books, looking at the work of these people, and I wanted to go see those places for myself and photograph them, and it's, it's, it's emulation in a lot of ways. Mm, right. And um, it, it's, hard, it's definitely becoming harder to make a unique photograph that, has, that people, you, you see a lot of emulation happen. And it's, I think it's challenging because there's an element of loving a place to death, and we're on the front end of it to a degree. Landscape photographers, we're promoting it whether we purposely tag it or not. So I think part of it, not to come back to it, but I think that's why story is valuable to me. Like, why are you making that image? And what, what is the story behind it? And maybe part of the story is we got to protect this place, or, or there's I, some I, we, I think weave that's there. such a good point, Pete. And your work has done a really good job of, of really helping that, too. And it's funny, because sometimes I, I hear younger photographers speak to this, and, and they're so much concerned. How do I create an original image? And sometimes I'm like, you don't need to. You and I could go to the exact same place, put tripods down in the exact same areas and in the grooves of other photographers and take a picture. And what I say about that experience, what you say about that experience could be completely different and could resonate with someone on a completely different level. I mean, obviously we all love to push ourselves and find new creative ways to shoot this and that. But at the same time, like we're drawn to these places because they're beautiful and because we love them. And our goal, regardless of if they get crowded or not, is to bring other people to the outdoors. I would, I would venture to say the majority of landscape photographers sharing landscape images is to inspire people to get outside. What I find the most important thing is if you're going somewhere, being educated on what the issues are. You know, not traveling blindly, trying to open yourself up to a little more research, a little more thought-provoking, you know, kind of uh, just awareness of what you're doing and what you're shooting. Is there a message to be told? Is there a uh, uh, something to bring awareness to and like how we're kind of telling that message. I think that's our responsibility as photographers and people who ideally live in these places and care about them. I think I've noticed that recently, especially for me, like growing through social media and, and having a lot of my focus being around that, realizing actually the value of the audiences that we all have and realizing that there's so much potential to talk about like like mindful mindfulness when traveling and thinking about like the footprint that you're leaving all those different places as well and like I moved out to Bali in February and the place is insane for tourists and right now every location around there is is blowing up with people and like but I think a lot of people that go to those places they have realized that they're not going to be leaving litter around they're not going to be leaving rubbish around they know that like the impact that they have there is going to reflect like badly on our entire planet and stuff and I think like more so I've realized now is how I can actually affect people's mindsets on that through the audiences that we have like you do Chris and like you do guys as well like it's such a valuable thing that we have. I've seen so many places where I live out west where five years ago I went there I was the only person there now I show up and there's a line of 200 people waiting to make the exact same picture and that's great I think we want people outside um, but we at the same time, there is some responsibility to the place. If if the, if your if your canvas is going to be the outdoors on that landscape, is there a question for us as photographers and storytellers to try to protect it the same way? And so, finding ways to I guess back to your point, and I think you do this well too, is why are you making this image? I think there's the saying that every picture in the world has already been taken, potentially. And so why are you making that image or your variation right. on that image again? And it's funny because it's easy in a film sense. Like when you're making a film, that's like the why is the most important thing. But with a photo, the barrier of entry is so easy. We're all just kind of like, oh, pull up my phone. You know, it's, it's, we, don't, we don't think about it as much. And I guess the first person we really should ask that question to is ourselves. Why are we standing at Horseshoe Bend? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, taking That's a what picture. I was thinking of when I was Yeah, of course you are. I know you are. <laughs> why are we standing at Horseshoe Bend? You know, because feels incredible to be there. It's amazing. I stood there with you my first time. I was blown away. So powerful. Yet, you know, I, I remember when I shared it, you know, on, online too, I talked about how like it's a weird thing to be there with so many people, you know, and but probably experiencing it, a similar sensation, you know, but how and what does that affect this area? It's really complicated and I don't really have the answer, but I think that if we first ask ourselves that and then ultimately through what we do, we can challenge others to ask themselves the same question as to, as to why. I mean, there's a lot of photos that I feel like I've shot that I haven't even shared because I haven't found a meaningful thing to write about. It's just like, yeah, I've got this photo of 
you know, Half Dome and well, you know, I don't know, maybe probably you have archives, I'm sure, of like stuff that's just kind of like sitting there, bangers, you know, like killer ones, but they just don't have a purpose. No, it's funny. I, yeah. I, 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 I feel you. Sometimes you feel like you have to associate a message with the picture, yeah. even though the reason, unless I'm on a job, you know, be it a commercial job or an editorial job where there's like something that needs to be meaningfully done. Right. I use photography as just a vehicle to travel and experience things, and I think that's what most people use it for. Um, most people that aren't doing it professionally, um, you see a picture you're inspired by, it gives you sort of a travel itinerary in a lot of ways, and you can go out there and stand at Horseshoe Bend for yourself and see what it smells like and see it with your own eyes and actually see it in a three-dimensional space. Um, that, and that, there's something beautiful about that. And to your point that, yeah, you go to Maroon Lake and Maroon Bells near your home in Aspen, and yeah, it's like wall-to-wall -wall people <laughs> surrounding the lake yeah. because it's so magnificent. Yeah. And it's hard when you, when you remember it the way it was. You almost feel a little curmudgeon when you show up and you're like, oh, I remember having this place to myself. <laughs> yeah. It's like we live in a different world, you know? Um, the population's insane. We all have cameras now. Like, things have changed. And um, I think it depends what you're the answer to why you're taking pictures is, is so personal and subjective. Um, even when I'm not sort of working as a photographer, um, photography is my life. I like live and breathe cameras, like filmmaking, photography, th those things just, they are such a part of my personal identity that if they were taken away, I don't know who I would be anymore. Like, I love it. But so much of the, of the time when I'm taking pictures, it's for me, you know? Unless I'm on a job and, it, and it, that's different. But I think most people that shoot, shoot to because for the joy of shooting you know to get tunnel vision like whenever you're doing the thing you love you get tunnel vision and that that is so cleansing to the mind you know actually speaking of bucket lists i mean seeing as though you guys have pretty much covered the entire planet what's like the bucket list location and for you guys oh man at i have this like point. eight <laughs> yeah really yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> so back, Still? back porch yeah what's that <laughs> back porch, back porch. <laughs> back porch. Oh, for more than like two days straight yeah more than two yeah. days straight with my mandolin that's a bucket list oh. always has <laughs> and you Jacob? it oh, that's a tough one i think uh it's actually i mean a place that so many people have been again on this topic but the south island of new zealand I've never been out there, and it looks incredible. And there's more so to adventure, <clears throat> and not necessarily to take photos. I just want to go in a car and experience the landscapes. Um, I got to experience an amazing photography um, trip recently in Barcelona. Something I'd always wanted to do was uh, fly in a helicopter over that city. It's a really unique city from above. And I found, I guess, over the last few months, I've been doing a huge amount of client work and, and not necessarily doing work for myself, and, and realized, obviously, to kind of feel the passion that sometimes you lose when you're doing so much client work. I had to go out and do something for myself and, and that was definitely taking off a, a huge bucket list. You still get like excited thinking oh, about wow. it and doing it. Like, and... Yeah, I had butterflies the whole time in that helicopter ride, probably because we were like harnessed <laughs> in hanging off the side of it. But like, yeah, experiences <laughs> like that, I think for me, it's just remembering that balance between what's work and what's also just the passion and the reason that I'm doing that is because I love taking photos and, and experiencing all these different places. That's right. And every, a lot of people think that as photographers, we're out in the field shooting 90% of the time. And I would say it's probably pretty accurate for most of us is that's not the case. Is sure. Most of the time we're, we're writing proposals, we're on the laptop more than we want to be, and the actual shooting is very small amount of time. And so the bucket list for me is getting into those moments where you're kind of, whether it's for a big job or not, or you're on a personal project, is that you're letting the creativity and the serendipity kind of drive you and finding the unexpected image where you you know you're letting that happen and sometimes it doesn't that's of course the challenge and the challenge is that's the fun of it too how do you balance that i mean the, the the art and the business side of it i mean you have to somehow walk that fine line i think the best advice somebody gave to me once was to look at your 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 biz, yourself as a business what how much money would you devote to marketing how much money would you devote to taking people out on lunches, you know, like if you start to actually divide up these pillars and think about it like that, then I think it becomes a lot more, makes a lot more sense. Instagram has made it so easy for, yeah. for everyone. Now we all own a publishing platform, so to speak. So to, it's to a Chris's noisy platform. Point, though. It's it a noisy platform, but crowded. when you build an audience, like you, you have an advantage at least. And, and, you know, I mean, PDN had a, an article months back 
basically talking about that websites are almost antiquated at this point because most art <laughs> buyers and agencies and editors yes. import. It's the first place. It's the first place they go to. It's the first. And place. I, also, I think it's secondary click is your website. And another, and that's such a good point you brought up because it, an early piece of advice that um, an agency gave to me was like, "Hey, your website's important, but if we're really going to hire you and you have a blog, we're going to go and look there." And the worst thing we're going to see is if your blog says, oh, I haven't updated in six months. Because the thing is, they want to know who you are. Us as a brand, what do we represent? Why would they want to hire you over me or you over me or whatever? Because of who we are as people. Because they want to spend time with you. And I, ultimately, it's the same thing as your social feed. It's like the people that you engage with interact with you and they, they like your message or whatever. I think it's just like you and I could both go to the Grand Canyon and shoot a cool photograph. you know. It's, it's a matter of how we, I think, articulate the message and this and that, but I was actually kind of wondering, sorry, Jacob, I was wondering, Pete, like, how did your career start? Like, I've, I feel like you've literally been in photography as long as I've ever picked up a camera. Like, are you trying to age me? And I'm not saying that in a bad way. It's because, like, early on, like, your Pete work is was... 24 years old. I know. Old. It's like, Jesus like, had a hard <laughs> life. I was 12 years old when I'm chasing yeah. posts came out. <laughs> well, it's, it's wow. Like, <laughs> that was only a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I mean... How old are you? From the, yeah, okay. From so. the beginning, like, I was, like... I, I remember your work and, and was inspired by it, and I always wondered, like, what? how did your career originate? Was it... Was it from a conservation background? Was it from an athletic background? Was it from, you know? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> no. Shut up. I started as, an, as a writer at a newspaper. No way. And then I picked up camera, and then I started doing expedition. So I started just like kind of you, like following what I loved, the outdoors. The camera was the, the tool to get in. And then I, I did a story for Nat Geo, uh, which was an aviation story, which was another one of my passions, flying. And then that opened the door. and then. But I think the interesting point is a lot of people, back to your question, how do you define our, what we do in our personal time versus our commercial work is people just think that, oh, Chris has suddenly started doing cars. He must have, you know, he didn't put any sweat equity into it. Or you suddenly, you know, you left the world of climbing and you didn't work on it. But I think all yeah, of us... That's definitely an assumption. It's an assumption and what I think, unless you're incredibly lucky or gifted. 99% of all photographers, it's hard work and taking a risk. It's taking a gamble to go in a different direction, whether it's leaving yeah. museums behind, whether it's leaving whatever. And for me, I left outdoor adventure. I still do it, but I went into more landscape and conservation work because I started thinking this was more important to me. And I took some huge risks. But is that something that you were able to do after you had achieved a, a relatively significant amount of success and, and stability? Yes and no. I would say, I mean, you've got to, you have to work and you have to prove yourself to get to a level. But at the end of the day, even today with Instagram, Instagram may make it easier, but you're only as good as your last story or your last images to a degree. You can't, in my opinion, you can never sit on your laurels. It's not like, oh, you've arrived as a photographer. It is a constant creative learning process. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of it. That's the challenge of it. And that's the misconception that most people have. I think everyone at this table is workaholics. Yeah. So, <laughs> Absolutely. No way. <laughs> you do have to hustle harder today, I think, than you probably did 20 years ago. I die. I just, as an addendum to all of this, it sounds like all you guys are doing commercial work. I don't do any at all. Okay, so back to your, your original question about catering to your business and doing things that are personal versus things that are going to help the business and shifting or pivoting or whatever and or avoiding pivoting. I don't really have to concern myself too much with all of that because that's never really been my gig anyway. So when I first got into landscape photography, I was told, well, if you want to make it as a fine art landscape photographer, what you need to do is go out and photograph grand landscapes of familiar locations because those are the prints that people are going to buy and those are the workshops that people are going to want. And I did none of that. I didn't do that at all. I completely went the other direction. I just got out a bunch of maps and <laughs> went to random places and just like put the boots on the ground and found cool stuff and photographed it. And it all worked out winningly for me. So I. I really have uh, developed this notion that, and I think probably everyone sitting around this table has done the same thing, is that you just do what it is that you do and just do it as well as you can and just work really freaking hard at it. And things tend to work out. Well, <laughs> I think that's I mean, how it goes, really. Yeah, you know? that's huge, Jacob. <laughs> uh, you were age, I mean, at 23 uh, and doing what you do, like, that's, that's a serious 
um, area of like competition there? Yeah, it's been interesting. I mean, like I, uh, I made the decision to do photography full time instead of university. Realized there was a lot more value in me. Extremely bold. Chasing something yeah. I loved doing. Um, I was fortunate enough to work at um, an agency for a couple of years and learn a huge amount. I think of the business side of things more so than anything. I like. I, I guess I knew I had a, a fair, fair amount of talent in photography, but I knew nothing if I was going to go freelance about the business element, like how to communicate with the brand, how for me to to build my name and, and, and get my work out there and all those things. And I was fortunate enough to do that and actually only went freelance in January this year. So I've been freelance now and it's been amazing. I mean, I've obviously kind of off on a good foot because of the audience that I have on Instagram, but I think also I'm now straight into competition with a hugely saturated platform of people who all want to be doing the same thing, who all want to be like working with the same clients and doing the same stuff. So it's been a, it's been a challenge, but an exciting one. And like everyone, Yes, yeah, working hard and, and spending countless nights every week just, just grinding and, uh, and doing the hustle because that's what it's all about, I think. Yeah. Is, is it your favorite question? Like, when was your big break? Right? <laughs> is that your next question? No, when but that's totally boring. You're like, like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm like, overnight success. It's yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Just one phone call. Yeah. It takes me 25 like years for that break. I love that question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just like, I never had to worry about anything ever after that. Like, mm -hmm. you guys, like, I don't even know where my next paycheck's coming from. It's yeah. like, you, you literally, like, you, you invest in so many little things that all kind of accumulate to, like, these bigger things that, you know, and it's, it's kind of a, a miracle in the end of it all. But I, I think it absolutely, like you said, being that age, it was terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. I mean, I'm still, I feel like I'm yeah. still such a, an amateur in, in some areas and, and still learning. I mean, like, I've picked up a camera six, seven years ago, maybe, and, like, I feel like I've learned a lot because I've put myself in environments that challenge me. And I know people maybe complain. I, I get a lot of people I know who are like, oh, I'm not, I'm not learning enough. I'm not like doing all these cool things or even I'm not growing on Instagram. It's like, but you're not putting the time and effort in yourself to, to grow your own skills. There is a, a lack of patience out there right now. Sometimes. Yeah, well, absolutely. It, absolutely. It really is. It's crazy. It's true. It's not for everybody. You have to, I mean, I would say any, anything in the arts broadly you have to put the time in you have to hear no a lot you have to suck you have to do all these things before you can get this <laughs> there's, there's no playbook <laughs> and it's great like Erin made it it's such a great point her road was completely different than ours we all have our own path you know we all came in into this um, completely ambiguous sort of business world um, I mean, I didn't go to I didn't go to Brooks or photo school or anything. I just sort of figured it out. Um, but I, I I don't know where where do you go to learn the business and the arts? You know, it's nowhere. it's such a yeah, nowhere. it's nowhere. such a strange it's like fake it till you make, make it. Yeah. You're yeah. always leaving money on the table. Like you don't know how to negotiate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like it's it, those things take time, right? And and uh, I feel like they iron out kind slowly. Of mentor relationship nowadays is even more important than it, it ever has been too. When those opportunities come, I know we've all had some sort of mentor mentee relationship and that's like a really fulfilling thing when you can either share that information or get you know and I, I think that's a really cool aspect too I, I also feel like a lot of things that happen out there nowadays or information people are looking for it's like you have to remind people that it's really easy to find on Google. <laughs> it's totally. like, I'm sure these days. I know. I'm like, dude, like, literally, it's like in your pocket. You could have the answer in like two seconds. But it's, a, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. It's like when somebody asks you a question, you're like, hey, like, you just want to hear this from me. Like, you know the answer. So what would be the craziest piece of, of like advice that I guess each of you would give to someone coming up in landscape photography now? And, and hopefully it's not the, you know, the same old adages, but something out of the box, something out of the blue that you might say. I mean, for Chris it would be, you know, go on Google, but otherwise. <laughs> you know, I, I, would, I would echo, I would, I would echo <laughs> Keith, you, you have to suck. Google. Yeah, th actually yeah. that's a good one. Yeah. You're gonna yeah. suck for a while. You have to suck for a while. You, in, in fact, you do. In fact, you oh have God, to suck. You you're gonna to. suck your whole, yeah. I suck n more now than when I was younger. I no one's gonna believe <laughs> that though. I mean, that is the elephant in the room. Yeah. yeah. That is not an it's true. Yeah, you, have, you have to suck. <laughs> I, I feel like the steps are pretty basic, right? You got to suck. Then you emulate, 
and then you finally find your voice. Yeah. Right. That, that's it, everything. Yeah. That's when you pick up a guitar. But then you're not afraid. Something. That's to, when you do it. Then you're not afraid to keep sucking because yeah, yeah, you no, want to sure. evolve. You, like, you actually have to enjoy this. I mean, you got to enjoy the failures. Like that's such a cliche thing, but it's true. Like if you want to get better, like pull out a camera flash and figure out how that works. If you want to get better, like try different depth of fields. Get off the wide angle. Do something different. Like you have to. You have to go through those steps. But if you don't enjoy those steps, dude, if you didn't enjoy photography, yeah. would it not be the worst job ever? The hours are outrageous. <laughs> but if you love it, it never feels, well, it, most of the time most it doesn't like work. But to you know? circle back to, I would say you have to take the risk to suck and, and learn from it. Always learn from your mistakes from the no's, which I'm sure the, the number of no's that we've heard at this table, yeah. you, you can build, you, you know, you can build a bridge money. across the river with them. Yeah, get good at rejection, that's Get good at rejection, nice. that's a good and, then, and yeah. then find story. Don't just try to find the landscape picture because, because Chris did it before and I'm gonna go do it differently or better. Like, find a story that means something to you and, and maybe something to the reason why. Yeah, and on that, on that point, what I, recommend is that people produce, it's two part, produce a ton, but then the other part of that is don't show it all. And that in that selection process, you learn something about yourself, about what, what is the story, what is it, you know, what, what in all of that really is me? Uh, and I think that's a really important exercise. You don't have to throw it all out there. Yeah. Yeah. And now in this day and age, it's like the appetite's huge, keep feeding it. And yeah. it's totally the opposite when really it's important to like, it's funny when people, when you share something like, this is from the archives, people are like, you have archives? You're like, yeah, I didn't share every photograph I shot on my trip. There was, you know, I went to, I went to remote Alaska, we shot 87,000 images in like a week, like, we showed you 100, like, you know, it's, it's such a hard thing too, because the world, the clients, yada, yada, they kind of, they want more, you know, and they're asking for more from us, but how do you keep value? That's the thing I find the, the hardest. Um, you, you said it kind of beautifully before, and Tad on it, we, um, a great photographer shares what they fear losing most. And I think that with that, I would, I would say that find ways to create value in your work. And I don't mean just like value, value to yourself, but also value long-term. From, that's the, that was the best thing that you, I've you know, watched, you know, Mike Fatale and other guys do with their, with their work is they've, they've been able to create prints that are worth, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. How do they do that? Well, by limiting how much it gets out there, by, you know, creating, uh, you know, having the client or whoever understand that the values, that the content is valuable, right? And then ultimately educating the consumers. So that, that's hard. mistake in your career uh, and it could be it could be something as simple as oh my god I went out to this great place and I left all my memory cards it could be that or it could be something <laughs> this great place and shot this whole shot and then you know scene and people like risking their lives and then realized they didn't have film in the camera that's mm. dating me that's, for that's one, one. <laughs> that's one like, you mean like a career mistake or just a mis just a little mistake it could be anything it could be funny it could be severe oh it could I, be a career anything <laughs> I remember one one thing that comes to mind and it's really just small but I remember going on this epic hike to reach this really remote spot that I had never seen photographed before, but I had some idea of where it was, and it involved getting into this lake and basically taking off a whole lot of clothing because I needed to hold it up ahead of, on, over me, and I was worried about my phone and my keys because I was in a remote area and I, the car didn't start. There'd be no way anyone would find me. So I did all of this, and it was freezing cold water, and it was a good hour to get like through all this stuff. The water kept getting higher and higher. I finally get, and I find the spot, and it's awesome. And I didn't have my camera gear with me because I just needed to find this thing first. And I was like, I'm not going back that way, because that was nuts. And I saw it looked like I could get up this little cliff by this feature and uh, so I'll just get up there and this who knows what I'm gonna be bushwhacking my way through to get back to the car but I'm not going back through the water so I get up on the little ridge and I saw my car <laughs> right there <laughs> I had gone all the way around <laughs> this crazy thing and there was like my car was like right there by the it was like a five minute little walk over this footpath oh my thing. <laughs> so. you better have some my, mine is uh... <laughs> Don't ask for food in a Russian jail cell. Uh, <laughs> don't. Uh, what would you get? Um, I got uh, two trays. One was cucumber and mayonnaise, 
and then one was soup. And I spent my, the rest of my 24 hours in detainment before being deported on the toilet um, in uh, Vladivostok. So that was fun. You have to back up there. Yeah, these are long Russian, stories. I'm just trying not to like Russian jail cell. So, like, these are some odd bullet points to broaden You got to explain a bit more of that one. This is like round table part two, where we yeah, well, all just discuss right. the, the crappy things that we've all, because we could go on forever. I'd be Don't like, drink camel's milk from a dodgy oil canister. Oh my God. Yeah, that's yeah. a good way to get meningitis. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, don't eat like, don't eat a shawarma from like a glowing sign in the middle of Oman in the middle of the night. That's not good. Yeah. But so, what did yeah. you do to end up in a Russian jail? Cell? I just had past visa issues and, and par parts of yeah. And, and that's Russia. how they deal with it. <laughs> it's just part, I mean, this is not St. Petersburg. It's not the most like you know diplomatic place. Like you're out of there. And they I got interrogated for six hours, put in a holding cell. I had a guard named Igor with one eye. No joke at all. Sorry if there's anyone named Igor here, <laughs> but um, it was intense and I was super scary. I was like 23, so I was watching a lot of Jack Bauer, 24 at the time, and I thought I could break out somehow, but. Instead, I just cried. So yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah, it was a pretty fun experience. I'm assuming your story can't really compete with that. Yeah. No, I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I don't really know. Like, I mean, everyone has the issues. You're like, I mean, the amount of times, as simple as it is, leaving the iPhone cable yeah. with the drones, right. hiking up crazy mountains and, and into unique spots, and then just like, you can't do anything. Or like, yeah, just being ill-prepared, I think, is, is something that I've just learned to just get the process right. Get the process right every time and, and don't cut corners when it comes to preparation for a trip. It, it, I would probably prepare more on a trip than actually thinking about the locations that we're talking about, like yeah, yeah. less planning on the actual research of the trip and more planning to make sure I have the right gear because it can put you in some difficult situations. You must be in some pretty precarious situations. I mean, all of you at some point have yeah. come into some I mean, hairy no, stuff, right? No image is worth risking your life at the end of the day. What's the worst thing? You sound like you have one in mind. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's except for that one. Pre, are we talking pre kids or post kids? Because right. uh, well, let's go pre. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, there's a couple. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is the pro. You have to love the process, mm. and you have to love what comes with the process. And for sure. failures and all of that. Yeah, for sure. I think it's also that social media has this like, misconception that everything you post was like this one time that you went there and you got it and it was amazing and. Oh, you got this so easily, and how'd you capture all these sunsets and all these... That happens things. with me, doesn't that happen with you? Isn't it just like, <laughs> like boom? And I tell people, I tell people, it's like, literally, I don't know how it happens, but I turn up and sunsets pop in every time I go. It's like... <laughs> Even in the middle of the day, if I pull out the camera, like, it turns to sunset. Out, I'm like, whoa. It's like, um, but yeah, it's like, I think, and that's, again, to the points we were talking about, about like putting your time and effort in, because we've been to thousands of loca like, well, to sunrises and sunsets and locations and, and, and not had luck or not had the conditions on our side, but the stuff we share and the stuff we right, obviously is exactly how we want it to look. And people maybe get the misconception that it's just that one time that we've been there and shot it and, and stuff, and I think. I think if we all took a month and just posted the times that it didn't work out. Oh it'd be so rad. <laughs> yeah. That would be amazing. I remember the, the last time I was an ultralight aircraft, I'm sitting there having the best time of my life. I like, woo, yeah, it's all great. And I start to smell this thing and my jacket is melting. It's on fire because the muffler's right here. And I just like let my hood start to unravel and it, it's burning and I'm just like, oh dear, like what? Like if I let my camera go and it hits the blade, like we're going down. So yeah, you're like, just, oh yeah, I'm in a lawnmower. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, like, <laughs> we're always like that close, you know? Like, you, like it's like the one boulder you didn't step on could have like yeah. been, you know, and I just think we're, like that's, that's what makes it so kind of memorable in a way too. Is it's a good story. Yeah. Oh, it's a good story. Yeah. It's, it's a good story. Frogger. You get that out of it if nothing yeah. else. Yeah. 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 Almost yeah. died, but you got a good story out of it. Lifetime yeah. memories from hell as well. For sure. Yeah, and speaking about you know going through hell sometimes to get these great shots, uh, I kind of do have to bring up this whole notion of post processing. I mean, when you can't always get it exactly to look how you want, how much are you guys relying on post processing today? And then. Is that something that you think is, is it good? Is it bad? Is it disrespectful to the locations? Or you know, how much do you embrace it or reject it, really? Embrace it. Embrace it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually fairly conservative in what, in what I do, but I'm very liberal in my opinions about it. I feel that everyone should just you know, <laughs> be an word. artist That's and, a beautiful way of putting and it. Uh, do whatever it is that they do. But uh, I, I personally love um, putting my, my polish on an image. Yeah, juju. Yeah. 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 I, I'm conservative because I grew up in a kind of evolved in a magazine realm. Right. I came through National Geographic mostly, and they have very strict standards. 
But that's because it's editorial and they're not trying to exactly. mislead people. And I think, so that's what I prefer. I like um, as long, but if you want to do whatever you want, do it, just own it though. Don't pretend yeah, it's yeah, in yeah. the camera. Right. Uh, if you want to create art and illustrate, go nuts. Make beauty however you want, but, but own it. Don't, don't claim that. You're yeah, the only person that saw it in your camera like this, because we all know. I love when people educate, you know, too, and be like, yeah, you know, like when there's, if they're removing something or they're adding something in, like, it's, it's just, just say that that's what you're doing. It's really cool. I, I love the, you know, creating it all on camera, similar to, to you, you know, coming from an editorial background. It was, I, I was always giving my editor suggestions for how I want it to look, but ultimately it was their art directors that were doing any color correction, right? So kind of like came with the notion of like, okay, well, this is, this level of, of post-processing is okay because that's what they're that's what they were telling me, you know. So, um, and as you start to kind of print your own work, you know, you, you can take certain liberties, this and that. But, um, but I love what you said, you know, of like, you know, here's my approach, whether it's conservative or liberal. But people should be able to do whatever they want. It's the, it's photography. It's art. It's meant to be. I think the only time it gets confusing is you see something online. And you're like, well. How is this road not there, or this telephone pole, or whatever? And, it, and if someone's creating digital art, that's a different thing. And I think that it's cool to like let people know, because in some ways, I think it kind of can dumb down sort of those who are really trying to create this in camera. You're shooting an eclipse in camera. You're shooting a supermoon or whatever. Like, we could all just add that in there. You know, you could all stack images. You could all do this. But there's a, I think there's a certain pride that people take in creating it in, in camera, and, and I, I definitely do, so. I mean, does it desensitize the public, though, from things that are natural? I think know? that's already, yeah, I think that happens all the time. Well, the hard part about it is a lot of times, you know, real moments can often be interpreted as something that was fabricated, you know? It, but it, it depends on the publishing platform you're working for. Just in, in a, to contribute to the, to the talking point at hand, the, if you're shooting for National Geographic, they're going to require raw files on everything. So there's only just, you, you only have, there's not a lot of weasel room there yeah. to do something. But if you're shooting something for yourself or you're working in the advertising world, it's like anything goes, yeah. you know. Um, the total carte blanche. And I agree with sharing on those platforms. I don't want to put something on one of their pages that's like super whack you sure. know, either too. Because like, yeah. that's kind of you doing, like you putting your thing on there. It's, you also kind of want to like kind of sift in those guidelines. Yeah, right? you want to stay on brand, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And, and so it kind of depends. I think it just depends what your medium is. If you're working in fine art, you're going to have a lot more latitude and flexibility. If you're working in a, in a, in a stringent editorial realm, you're going to have different challenges there. Um, if you're simply doing it for yourself, I feel like probably anything goes. But to, I think to Chris's point, yeah, if you're, if you're putting something out there that, that might be questionable, or, or maybe Pete said it, just own it. You know, if you did anything that was, you just like, no, this was just simply for the creation of something, I would say just, just own it. Um, the worst thing to do is to not, because then you get this horrible reputation and anything you've ever done becomes questionable. I think there's also so much power in the tools that you can use as well. I think there's so much, like, Photoshop is this insane program. You can go in and you can take whatever you want and create something brand new. I think there's a fun process to that as well. Like, I definitely enjoy going in and taking photos, taking several photos and, and bringing them together and, and creating something entirely new sometimes or, or just building out something that I guess has that kind of unique signature on it from a editing standpoint, not necessarily from like the in-camera process. And I think it's a fun balance for me between the two and obviously it depends on what I'm doing and where I am and, and all those different elements that kind of come with that. So is like adhering to realism higher in your priority list or not particularly? It's a mixture. I think it really depends. I think I, I'm I'm pretty impartial to it, to be honest. I think I enjoy both. I like obviously creating a photo where you're looking at the back of your camera and you're like, wow, this, this is unreal. Like nothing, nothing beats that. That, that moment is, is insane. I think that's what every photographer lives for, to look at the back of their camera and know that they've just created this image that is this moment in time that you're probably never gonna see again. Um, but then I think there's also the fun part of actually going into Photoshop, whatever app you use and, and creating it. Yeah, yeah. And this may be controversial, but my feeling is that what's really healthiest is for people to have a very healthy distrust of photography, because even in photojournalism, mm. there's a lot just by the way you crop something or just by your selection of a subject, yeah. the way that you can have an enormous selection impact on, yeah, yeah, on, on what people are seeing. And I think if we're going to train the public one way or the other, it's not to trust photos and to think that mm. any of it's real, because it's really not. You know, it's all so a process of selection. The lens alone and, yeah. 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 and editing. It's all 
all about editing the world any way you look at it. And I think that the more that people believe in that, the less that they'll believe that models aren't airbrushed and all the rest of yeah. it, you know. It's a really good point. <laughs> it's a great yeah, point. I, I agree with a lot of that, but I also agree, or I also disagree in the sense that I think of Christina Mittemeyer's photo last year of the dying polar bear. Right. Think of how many people, uh, the, uh, billions of people saw that photo, and it was a real eye-opener to, uh, it was a climate change bellwether, right? It was kind of like this very impactful moment, and there was, there was nothing post-production-y about it. There was a real message there. So in, in some regards, I mean, photos do have the ability to change people's opinions, and I think we, we need to be able to trust that. We do need to be able to trust a photograph. I completely like agree. I, I would just add that in that sort of a situation, it's, it's because of the statement that comes with it. You know, just like saying, well, just owning something that you've, you've made as your creation, you're also saying, I, I'm owning the, the truth to what I'm showing here, which is that this polar bear is, you know, an icon of a problem. And that problem is real. And so whatever you have to say about the photo matters in that regard as well, and I think is very powerful. So I think. With photojournalism, um, that statement that you know this much of this photo is actually an issue, and I'm, this is illustrative of that issue. I think that's important. But if in, if nothing's said about an image that's that's put in sort of more of an artistic context, yeah. the assumption shouldn't be that it's real. In fact, I, I'd prefer it to be just the opposite. So there, there's some social responsibility there, I guess. From yeah, right I mean, too. just as much as the landscape photographer has social responsibility, the photojournalist even even more yeah. so on a on a blueberry. And I think you story. have to you have to own your own integrity. You have mm -hmm. to own your own ethical area. Be like, I'm going to admit to what I'm doing. I'm doing trying to do everything as accurately as possible. Or I'm in this particular situation, I'm going to illustrate something. So back to owning it, I guess. Yeah, own it. You do you. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so what's next for you guys? What's uh, for each of you? What is, what's on the horizon? Anything cool coming up or something you're really looking forward to? I'm releasing my first workshop, which is exciting, online course. I did a couple of like, nice. uh, like in-person workshops for 10 days in Bali recently, um, but doing a full kind of 10 to 15 hours of online workshop courses, which is exciting for me. So it's first project. Just I realized I enjoyed I guess it's one of those things that I learned. I, well, I realized that I had a lot more knowledge than I thought I did. <laughs> and it kind of, when you do something, obviously the stuff that we do, it just becomes so second nature. You don't forget, you kind of forget the process that goes into it. So when I started talking to people about it, like realized that value. And, and for me, it's been a really fun process, actually, like putting it all into a video and, and creating this online course. So that's the next step for me, which is exciting. And enjoying that's the super cool. space. Because it's, Congrats. That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. And you, Chris, I'm sure there's a trillion things coming up. Um, there's a couple things going <laughs> on, yeah. Um, going to Iceland tonight. After, tonight. I, after I teach a workshop, <laughs> teaching a filmmaking workshop in a couple hours, then I have to go to fly to Iceland, then I come back and I go to New Zealand, then I'm going to Colorado, then I'm going to Lofoten Islands in Norway, then a couple other things. I don't know, it's, a, it's fall. I'm waiting for American <laughs> immigration to give you trouble. It's September. <laughs> um, yeah, just busy, you know, it's like I've had actually a couple months at home which I really loved and able to spend a ton of time with my kids. And, and then, you know, it's usually kind of, I try to pack a lot of stuff into a short period of time so I can focus on just being, giving 110% to work and then come back and be home, so. In your area? Uh, I too am headed to Iceland uh, at the end of this week. Uh, we are doing a workshop out into the Highlands. It's all remote stuff with monster trucks. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really great. looking forward to that. It's gonna be really fun for, for 12 days. You know. Um, I have a new book coming out with Rizzoli and a new feature film. I spent a year walking the entire length of the Grand Canyon, which I don't recommend. That's still your story there, man. It's <laughs> an 800 mile journey. But the, uh, the cool part of that, though, is it's probably the most photographed landscape on the planet. And I was forced to kind of to really look, to look to try to find different things. So it's kind of an art book, and the f film is. Um, documentary about that that's coming out. And the book is called Grand Canyon Between River and Rim. The film is called Into the Canyon, comes out next year, celebrate the centennial celebration of the Grand Canyon National Park. Wow. The canyon's a little older than 100 years, but uh, <laughs> so I got that and I'm working on a film in Kenya this fall. So. Nice. Um, most of the rest of my year's advertising work. Um, I'm working on a book right now that's like where my free time lives right now when I can find it. And um, 
uh, yeah, mostly just advertising work. I got some stuff in Europe coming up. Hawaii, Tonga, I'm gonna go join a friend of mine to do some just whale photography Kareem. recreation. Like with Kareem, oh, he's I'm been so asking jealous. me for years. Dude, dude I'm, I'm finally, so yeah. jealous. It's, that's like it'll a, be bucket, fun. That's yeah. a bucket list thing for sure. Yeah, that is a bucket list. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm like kind of scared they're gonna like, yeah. echolocate <laughs> me and like want to mate or something. Yeah. Exactly, well that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's where the adventure is. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, and then a trip to Africa later in the year. No, oh, this has been great. I mean, really, thank you, Aaron, yeah. Pete, Keith, Jacob. Chris, this was fantastic. Well, thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed that, you can subscribe, and we'll see you next time.